They wouldn't touch the slave trade for how many years? Until 1808, for 20 years. And where do they meet? Independence Hall in Philadelphia. And do we get to the executive branch at all? Oh, who is this going to benefit? What group would this? No. I, uh, let's go back. I asked two questions. I basically, I, I asked a two open ended on the question. Didn't I? Let's go to the first one. The three fifths compromise benefited who? What section? And what did the North call the three fifths compromise? And then the Constitution in general was supposed to benefit who? Small states. Yes, it does represent small states. But what group? Just what people in society? Elite. Not sure rich, but elite. And because it made it very difficult to do what? Yeah, to change it. It's really difficult to pass radical laws. It's really difficult. Is that right where we quit then? We got checks and balances in Montesquieu. Are we good? All right. So we're going to make a triangle. It's going to leave yourself some room, but it's going to have the executive branch, legislative, and judicial. And this is Article 1. And the executive branch is not just the president. It's in all of those, now we would say cabinet level posts and all those offices that deal with carrying out laws. If you ever have an interaction with the executive branch or with the government, it's going to be the executive branch. That's the Article 1. It's Article 2. It's Article 2. It's Article 2 of the Constitution. And even though executive branch is the, by far the most powerful, Article 1 with the legislature is bigger, and that's why it's first. And the executive. And I'm trying to think of interactions like the military, the embassy soldier, you know, that's executive branch. My guess is you've probably not seen very many FBI agents. A few maybe here or there. Uh, the one I have the most interaction for would be stuff like Forest Service or National Park. You know, I see one of those rangers, third, third executive branch. They're all part of, so technically under the umbrella of the president. And so this is the biggest branch. And this is what they do. First off, they're commander in chief of the armed forces. Now, in the Constitution, it says armed forces, it, it's, it basically implies, because of the way it's written, in wartime. But Congress has said, you know, they should probably be commander in chief in peacetime so we have a consistent command. And so they're commander in chief of the armed forces. It was unclear if that meant that they would actually lead the armed forces into battle. So in 1794, when troops were called out to put down what's called the Whiskey Rebellion, President Washington actually led them from the front. It is impossible to imagine the president now doing that. You know, leading the troops, I guess, on horseback from the front. Or any of the other presidents of this time, but oh, the president is not. Your commander in chief. The president is only the commander in chief of the armed forces. The president cannot order you to do anything. Just say, do it, you must follow. He is not your commander. So President Trump walks through those doors and says, stand up, everybody. You do not have to. But by, oh, yeah, we're supposed to yell assassin and hide under your desk. That would be kind of interesting, wouldn't it? But my guess is if the president did walk in, and said, stand up, you all would, because you'd be so shocked to see the president. He hasn't come, the president hasn't been down here for years. In fact, we've had, we've had a one former president come twice to the Capitol, and that's it. Who was that? Miller huh? Fillmore. 17, 18th of 18th. No, Clinton, Clinton came here twice. Bill Clinton. Why? Who came to the gym? Yeah, yeah, both of them. Jim, yeah, it's here. The first one is campaigning for his wife in the Democratic primary, and then the same year he was campaigning for then Senator Obama. So with that, next, he also, President does foreign affairs, specifically no, negotiates treaties. Uh, the president speaks as a single voice for the country in foreign affairs, even though there are checks to this. Also, something else, and it's really important. I'm forgetting something. I'm forgetting 
Who are you people? It's gone now. Fear senility. And then, oh, let's just get right to this. They execute and interpret laws. And this might be the most powerful, important thing that a person, oh, I know what I was thinking. I veto, but veto's a check. I just said veto. This is the most important thing. Congress passes laws, but the president carries them out. And this is almost unlimited power, executes and interprets the law. The, so laws come to the president, and the president will decide how his, his branch will carry it out. That's the interpretation. Sometimes you'll see, you see this in our textbook, that it says the Supreme Court interprets laws. No, the Supreme Court does not interpret laws. It's the president who does this, because the president's the one that's carry it out. And if you ever hear the term executive order, President Trump has issued a lot of executive orders, basically to reverse um, executive orders of President Obama. Executive orders. It has the force of law because an executive order is how the president is interpreting that law. This is immense power. Just by change a little bit of how you enforce a law, how a person enforces it, can change so much in society. If the president does not believe in, let's say, regulating the stock market or the financial, or financial institutions, and they just simply say, we're not going to enforce those laws. That will have a big impact that happened in your lifetime. The 2000s helped lead to the, the crash, why it was so bad. Or if the president does believe in, let's say, environmental protections. So to, to a small degree with President Obama, they enforce and interpreted those laws more strict. Then President Trump has reversed all of those. In fact, there's now going to be significantly more mercury in the air. Which I, you know what, I'm so tired of kids being insane. You with me on that? So with that, but don't you see why this is big power? And couldn't they enforce it for some people and enforce it and not enforce it for others? That's why the president is so strong. And that's why the anti-federalists fear this position. This is big. There are checks, but it's really hard. So everyone got that? That's the biggie. That is the most important job of the president. The governor does that in, in the state, for example. We don't have an equivalent at the city level, basically. So, then we have checks, and this is a check this way and a check this way for the legislature. And the legislature, that is Article 1, and for the legislature, this has the bulk of the powers. They list them down, and it is enumerated. Enumerated powers. And so they can pass laws, but remember, the executive carries them out. And one more thing about this. Don't forget, both houses have to pass the exact same law, or, or the bill dies. And so I'm going to list down a few. This is from Article 1. There's a, there's a bunch of them, and there's a bunch of things they can't do. We're not going to go through all, the, all that. We're just going to lay out ones that we can, you know, we'll, we'll refer as the year goes by. So I'm going to put them up here so I don't have to bend. But... The powers will be such things as they can tax, incredibly important, even though this is pre-capitalism. That's one thing you have to remember about the Constitution. The laws that we operate under are pre-the economic system that we operate under today. We weren't capitalistic yet. Capitalism didn't exist. We have proto-capitalism, but not capitalism. And so, don't forget, it's like a different world. But they wrote it in such a way that it could expand. It borrows money. Governments cannot function unless they can borrow money. Spirit can't function. And borrowing money is more than just having the ability to say, we're going to borrow money. People have to believe you'll pay it back. The United States has always paid back its debts. And so... Hmm? Oh, sure. But we always pay back our debts. So any debt, we always make the payments on bond. We always pay back the bonds. Even though we always have debt, but almost everybody always has debt. And they print and coin money. 
printing coin money. <laughs> Even though they do, they did give the president the ability to coin any coin the president wants as a commemorative coin. So if the president wants, they can coin a ten trillion dollar coin. I thought that'd be kind of cool. If the president wanted to, by executive order, they could print, they could coin it. And How would they dollar. make it a 10,000? A 10 trillion? Yeah. I'm writing 10 trillion. Well, it has to be more complicated than that, no, right? I'm not kidding. No. Next. They wouldn't know how to define it. Next. Uh, other stuff. Oh, they. Build the army and arm and train the militia. I, I, I put army, but the military and navy, and then eventually the air force. But I put down the army just because I did. They actually have two separate clauses for the army and navy, but they military, and they arm the militia. But this is actually going to be a major, uh, major issue when ratifying the constitution because it was not clear that the states would have control over militias. In fact, it would be such a big deal about states' control of militias that James Madison, who wrote the Bill of Rights, would write a, bill, a part of the Bill of Rights about this very clause. Next, they declare war. And this was a check on the president, so the president, the president wouldn't just uh, use the military as for, to create an empire, or the thing about it is, wars, if a country goes to the war, that is the most effective way for, that lead, for the leaders of that country to become dictators. War almost always leads to tyranny in history. Because, think about in a country, you're gonna have people for and against you, there'll be dissent, you're gonna think you know, the political opposition. But at war, is it impossible to call the political opposition traitors and have humanity? So we gotta crack down on them. That always happens. Always. Always. Including now. We've been a warrior entire life. And there are more restrictions on rights today than there were when I was your age. Without a doubt. You guys don't know any different. I'm not criticizing. <laughs> you guys don't understand. No. It's just that you've had you've known nothing else. You've known so nothing else. Like oh god, just chaos. Now we're not gonna go into details of all of that. But just for example, the you know the, there was not as much power to surveil, to secretly surveil us, to read our mail, to bug our phones. But th th those powers didn't exist. Now they exist. If they think you're su suspected of terrorism, they can search your house and never know they were there. It's called the sneak and peek. It's fun. <laughs> Next, that's supposed to be an R. Oh, declaring war. When's the last time Congress has declared war? World War II. Exactly, World War II. Congress has not declared war since World War II. Since we countered the Declaration of War Bill, 41. And so all the wars we've been now, Congress has basically just said to the president, do what you want. So they have not been carrying out their duties, constitutional duties. Next. They can regulate commerce. There are more post office. I mean, I go through a lot of the powers. All of these are called clauses. So each line of the Constitution is a clause. But here's the thing. They knew that just simply saying printing money might not be enough. They understood in 1787 that times might change. They had no idea what's coming. They could never predict it. What's going to happen with the Industrial Revolution? It was just beginning in Britain, and they had no idea. But they knew Congress is going to need flexibility. So they added the last of these clauses. This is the copy of the Constitution. And is my mouse on? No. So they go, these are all powers. These are things they can't do. We're not going to go through them all. But right here we have to do, everybody read number 18. Can you see it? Read it. To make yourself.
Can you read it? So first off, now you know why lawyers exist. To interpret this stuff that they write. It's called job security. It pays well. What I want everyone to write down is this. The necessary and proper clause. This is the most, arguably the most important part of the Constitution. And the most controversial. Did you hear, did you hear me? Gabby was talking, so you probably didn't hear me say write down necessary and proper. Did you? Put your head down in shame. The necessary and proper clause. Slide. What does it say you can do to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers? So they can make whatever law that is necessary to carry out all the powers. The powers I wrote down behind that. They can do whatever is necessary and proper to regulate commerce, whatever is necessary and proper to print money, etc. So, what powers does this give Congress? Exactly. Almost infinite. In fact, it's because whatever they're going to get a name for, it, this power can be stretched like a rubber band. So it's called the write down, write down this elastic clause. Elastic clause, like a rubber band. They can stretch it. And it's also called, gotta write one more thing, implied powers. Remember I said those are enumerated, the listed one, now this one's implied. I'll give you an example. It says that Congress can print money. It says that Congress can borrow money. It says Congress can tax. But here's the thing. Okay, now what? If they print money, how do you distribute it? How do you get it out to into circulation? Do you stand on three corners with bushels, bushel bath, uh, Baskets of uh, money, just kind of toss it in the air. Hey, everyone, have some money. Yeah. What do you distribute? How do you distribute money? Yeah, don't you give it to the big banks now? Banks. Oh. And who gives it to the banks? Alexander Hamilton said, to distribute money, we need to build a national bank, which is today called the Federal Reserve. <laughs> Nowhere does it say in the Constitution that the U.S. government can build a bank. But he said it was necessary and proper. The bank is the best example. I'll give you another one. Nowhere does it say that the government can uh, regulate child labor. Nowhere. But it says government can regulate interstate commerce. And they said because these are companies that cross state lines, Government can regulate it because it is yes. necessary and proper. <laughs> Got it? Uh, do you see why this is a big deal? Do you see why this is big? Because this can imply government can have infinite powers. And whatever group is in charge, don't you think they love this? You're in charge? So you're going to see who, whatever party has power, they love implied powers. And then as soon as they're out of, out of power, what do they say about implied powers? They, they got to go! Follow the Constitution! And then with their power, with their power, let's do it all! Like Thomas Jefferson did in that video we saw last week. So, with that, they, that is the basis of the legislative branch. They write the laws. They're relatively small, incredibly important, but relatively small as the number of people involved. And then we have the last one, which is the smallest of them all. Judici judicial. The judicial branch is a tiny little part of Article 3. I mean, tiny little part. And all it basically says is there'll be a Supreme Court, but never says what it will be or even what it will do. And a court of appeals. So if a lower court, you can dispute a lower court's ruling by taking it to the next court up. And like, basically, the Supreme Court was going to be like the highest court of appeals, like your last way you can appeal a court ruling. But then they would give themselves immense power, too. It's not the Constitution, they would just do it. The legislature. So, that's the three branches. Let's do the checks then. Everybody has checks. Let's go here first. The president can veto, can't they?
the president can veto, and Teddy Roosevelt said the other power. It's not really a power like, per se, it's more they can persuade. And Teddy Roosevelt called it the bully pulpit. And since I like Teddy Roosevelt, we're going to call it the bully pulpit. The bully pulpit thing of a pulpit being a lectern where a minister would speak to a church. And basically what it was is the president could use the, in, the power of the presidency. Because think about it, the president talks fast news. If the president says anything, now if he, if he uh, tweets, it's news. And that's a way to influence. Now, it could actually backfire, but that's influence. In fact, the biggest one they could say, we're going to veto the law. Just the threat of a veto can get a law to change. Presidents rarely veto, but they threaten it. Next, this way, the legislature can, they can do a number of things. First off, the Senate can do two things. The Senate can, they ratify treaties with a two-thirds vote, and they confirm appointments. Like Secretary of State. So that's go to the Senate. So that's a check on the power. So they can't pick somebody who is blatantly corrupt or something. I mean, technically they could. These are still political functions. And then, also we have, uh, they can override a veto, but that's really hard to do. How many votes do you need to override a veto? Close, two-thirds. But still, two-thirds is almost impossible. There's rarely any vetoes because just the threat of a veto is enough to make Congress change because it can't override it. I mean, you gotta go back 20 years the last time they overrode a veto. Who was it? I can't even remember now. It's during the Clinton administration. Is that just because of a uh, two party system? The numbers just right on the wall work out? Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah, usually because of political issue. They usually voted against it in the first place. You're rarely you're going to get a law passed that has over, and that's another thing too. If a law passes with over six, two thirds of the vote, the president will veto because he doesn't want the embarrassment of having it overridden. And then impeach. The president can be impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors, but high crimes and misdemeanors, the founding fathers were clearly thinking about corruption, like using the power of the presidency or the Supreme Court or something like that to get rich. But that is not defined. And impeachment is a political process. This is politics. And it's not exactly what you think. Impeachment happens in the House. And if they get impeached in the House, they're still in office. It goes to the Senate for trial. And therefore, and there you need two thirds of a vote. So the House impeaches, the Senate, that's where the trial is. And I'm using the term trial, but this is not a court of law. This is a political process. And because of that, there's only been two presidents impeached, and both of them were not found guilty in the Senate. Who were the two presidents impeached? Andrew Johnson. Exactly. And one, Andrew Johnson, Lincoln's vice president. And Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton was the other one. And those are the only two that have been impeached. Now, Nixon would have been impeached almost certainly, but he resigned before that happened. Wait, what did Nixon do again? We'll get to it. We're not going to talk about Watergate right now. Nixon, there's probably never been a bigger, more criminal activity in any presidency than the president. It was basically like a mafia family. It was like a mafia family. I'm not exaggerating. So, that's this. Let's get to the legislature. The legislature can impeach a judge. So this is going this way. They can also say hi to the judge. No, they can also do something else. I forgot. I'm getting old. Oh, they create the court system. They literally create it. So they say how many members are going to be the Supreme Court, how many federal courts will, will be, how many courts of appeal. Congress does that. So Congress can turn around and say, we're no longer going to have nine members of the Supreme Court. We're going to have 50. If they vote for it and sign by the president, they can do it. I mean, we've been at nine for 100, geez, 150 years, just about. I kind of think it should be more. 15? But, you know, that's another story. And 
They confirm appointments. They, the Senate confirms appointments to the court. And that is what's happening right now. It appears as though the Senate is going to vote on federal judge Brett Kavanaugh, who was nominated by President Trump, and he's almost certainly going to be confirmed tomorrow. My guess is, if I was a gamble man, I'd say 50 50. And, huh? and that's going to be one of the more consequential uh, uh, appointments in history, especially for women. Will we have a conservative balance now? Oh, yeah, it's very conservative. But it's going to be, for women, this is going to be a big deal. Next, we're not there yet. I don't like talking about those things until we have backgrounds. We're still here. <laughs> but these things relate. If these arguments back then, they were thinking about it. Here, the judiciary, oh, let's go right to the executive first, the executive appoints. And think about what that means. If a president appoints a judge, how long is the term for a judge? Whether it be judge, federal court or Supreme Court, yeah. It's the same as an it's lifetime. So if the judge appoints it today, especially if they're young, like the two, and that's something without doubt that the current administration understands. They're appointed two very young men. And so that's relation to judges. You know, late 40s, early 50s, that's young for a judge. And they could be on for how long? 30 or 40 years, legitimately. So he is going to be long gone. I might be very much long gone. That's getting close. That, that would be my time, too. And you guys would be near retirement. We might still have those judges. That means the influence of Trump, President Trump, might go on for 40 more years. Judges are big deals. This isn't really important. Maybe almost too much power in those hands. And they gave themselves the power of judicial review. And it's the same here, judicial review. The Supreme Court gave themselves the power to check the constitutionality of laws. Did you hear what I said? Judicial review to check the constitutionality of law. That's not in the Supreme Court. But if a, if a case makes their way to the court system, through the court system, to the Supreme Court, they can rule on its constitutionality. And that's called judicial review. They don't look at any laws unless there's a court case that gets them. So there are laws on the books in states and the federal level that are unconstitutional, almost certain. But, unless it gets here. Yeah. So if a law is passed and it's clearly unconstitutional, it's not going to be overturned until a court case comes back to it. I know that seemed like a statement, but that was a question. I know what you're yeah. saying. I know. Yeah. And so, and now the executive could choose not to enforce it. Like in Montana, for, heck, for, for, for almost 40 years, Montana had a law in the book that banned homosexual sex that was already found unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. It was on the books, but the executive did not enforce it. But it was still there, so technically the executive, they could turn around and start enforcing it. So that's the Supreme Court, yes. Yeah. Oh, with executive orders, can the judicial uh, mm -hmm. branch? Yeah, that? that's the judicial review. They can, they okay. can uh, review executive orders, too. So that actually is happening right now when uh, President Trump tried to overturn some of the environmental laws, and a couple of them have been called by judges saying you're violating the Constitution. So that can happen. And I know the ball's about ready to rain, but let me get to this last thing really quick. I know, I'm late. But I blame, I blame society. I blame man, I blame man, humanity, inhumanity to man. So with this, one more thing. It can be amended. And to amend it, it requires Congress two-thirds and then three-quarters of the states. So do you get the point? It's really hard to amend the Constitution. The last time the Constitution has been amended was 1991. And that bill, that proposal for a constitutional amendment was first proposed by James Madison in 1790. It took 201 years. Wait, so so Congress, two thirds states, three fourths to make like yeah, two, yeah, two thirds of Congress and then three quarters of state agree, then you can amend the Constitution. Like all the states combined are the first state. Yeah, three quarters of all the states. Okay. So you need 38 states. And 
One more thing. Pay attention up here. One more thing. Nine states to ratify. Nine states to ratify your Nine, I'm sorry, nine states to ratify the Constitution that comes along. And remember, the article did require 13. So they just said we only need nine. So tomorrow the rap battle. And, and that, that's me walking, right? Yeah. No, I'm so tired of that one question. So on this, you should have more than that. Why is that? That's I weird. Know, like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Like, 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 you know, maybe because it wasn't fine. That's really that's really weird. Oh, all right. You got um, your sister busted you. You were skipping up today. She busted you. She said she was skipping. So three. So so you you get mad at her. Where is she? I want to hear. See, I knew. I knew. I knew how to breed discontent. Uh, I didn't just. She did. I will let me hold on to this. I'll give you the point. No, I got it. I got it. That's, right. That's really weird. Right? I was like, oh, yeah. can I read you? Yes, you may. What? So, I like it. And just will quickly do it. I like it. For the first time, I have no problem getting used to doing them. Mm -hmm. Thank you.